Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is geometric topology. Today, I would like to continue a little bit with uh, classification of surfaces uh, via words and polygons. Um, since it gets a bit subtle, it's not so bad. It's actually pretty beautiful, but it gets a bit confusing. So I decided to make kind of another video on this, um, on this idea of having punctures, handles, and projective planes. So what is the classification of surfaces? And again, those three numbers will play or those three objects will play the crucial role here. Okay, as a reminder, we had the polygons and words, just start somewhere, uh, walk along around the, the polygon, and you get a word A, D, B, C inverse, A, D, B, C inverse, and inverse C inverse is uh, just denoted by an overline, just to make my life easier. And the problem was, or kind of the problem in quotation marks that I explained in the last video was that uh, there are some rules like the necklace rule and the free edge rule. Um, uh, so those are all the same edge, for example, uh, for those words. And we kind of need to make sure that we know uh, what we are talking about. So there shouldn't be any uh, ambiguity in the definition how, or in the process of going uh, from a surface to a word and back kind of back is the problem from going from a word to a surface. And that's kind of the idea. That's what I'd like to discuss, um, how to go from a word to kind of a, a normal form of a surface. Like um, surfaces, again, are kind of only defined in some sense up to homeomorphism. So they kind of might look very different, but there should be some normal form where we can just read off what it is. That's the main idea here. Okay, so um, for example, these guys, are called normal forms. And now I'm going to explain what they are. So for example, if you take, let's take the middle one, which is kind of the easiest one to imagine. So if you take a three here and you just attach three handles, this is the symbol I'm going to use. Then you get this three fold, um, well, object, the donut with three holes. This, I, I think you can't buy this donut object anywhere, but uh, I, I might be wrong. Uh, but you can see the three handles, but you would like to think of them as being just a sphere with handles attached, which is the same picture, obviously. Uh, but we like to count numbers, so we only count the number of, um, uh, well, handles in this case. And why do we want to do this? Because it sometimes gets a bit tricky. So if we, for example, hash three disks, to a sphere, we get, well, the one with three punctures. So here the D number later will be three. Here the T number later will be three. And there will be a P number later it will be three in the bottom case. But anyway, so did you get three punctures, right? You just count this number here. But there's a different version of the surface, which is uh, the disk with two holes. And now you might wonder, well, wait, 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 two, two is not three. So how does it work? Well, it's a bit tricky. There's also the outside hole, which is a third puncture. Uh, it's a little bit tricky. That's why we really want a normal form. I mean, this is not so bad if you think about it for a second, because we start with a sphere uh, and just the outside is kind of the third puncture. Uh, but still having a normal form is very preferable. In particular, if those funny projective planes uh, enter the game where you just start with a balloon, right? A closed balloon S2, and you glue in <laughs> one of those guys, and it's extremely hard to imagine. And in my notation, I just draw those little things. Uh, sure, whatever. Draw those little things. It's just hard to imagine anyway. You kind of glue in Mobius strips, and it kind of messes up the orientation. And every surface is kind of a combination of those operations, which is, again, a pretty cool statement by itself. But those guys here, I would, would I like to call a normal form. So here are a few more examples. So normal form in the, in the sense of words, exactly the same things as before. For example, in, a, in the case of a word, the normal form of this guy for a torus is you just repeat the torus, which is this expression. So A, B, A inverse, B inverse, you just repeat it as often as you need it. And for the projective plane, the corresponding expression is AA, and you just repeat it as often as you need it. And by repeat is you just replace the letters with different letters. Uh, this one, for example, has this normal form. Um, we can try to check that. So let's see how many free edges this have. This, this, this guy is clearly paired. This guy is clearly paired. So hopefully it has three free edges. So let's see. Um, this vertex here is the end of edge B. So it also is up here. Great. So this vertex is this vertex. We have one vertex already, and A is just an edge. 
Uh, this vertex down here is also at the start of B and at the end of F. So those guys are actually paired, uh, which is good because that means C is again a free edge. Uh, those things are paired and E is again a free edge. So we have our three boundary components. And now we can just stack those words together and you get uh, the standard word form for uh, a surface. That's pretty cool. So um, tori and a very e well, the easiest one in the word form are actually the projective planes. They're just symbols repeated. Um, they're a little bit hard to think about in the terms of geometry or in terms of the topological picture, but they're the easiest ones here, just the numbers repeated. The torus is a bit more complicated. It's A, B, A bar, B bar. Um, and the one that is geometrically the easiest is just you poke a hole into your surface, it's a puncture. If this has a bit tricky, and these are the ones where you need to be careful with those three words. Uh, it's kind of fun that everything turns around in complexity. Anyway, so here's then again the statement, um, a little bit of a beefed up version from last time. So you can actually do better. You can have P being zero or one. I explain in a second in the next slide why you can do that. But uh, every surface is of the form. Um, I should every surface not equal to S2 because I'm missing a factor S2 here is of this form. You have the numbers D, H, and P. Uh, so it's completely determined by the number of punctures, the number of handles, and the number of projective planes. Uh, in other words, it's completely determined by the number of boundary components. These are the punctures. It's Euler characteristic, which turns out to be measuring the handles and whether it's orientable or not, which is whether it has a Mobius strip inside or not. Kind of fun fact, it stays unorientable no matter how many Mobius strips are inside. So it's kind of enough to decide, well, you have zero or one of them, zero or one projective planes. If you have two of them, you can kind of replace them by something different as I'm going to show you. Um, so in order to determine a surface from the polygon, you compute its Euler characteristic the only tricky part in computing the Euler characteristic is to get the edges. Uh, sorry, the, you have the edges, you have the face, that's no problem. So here you have eight edges, you have one face, you just need to the vertices. So you just go around in exactly this fashion here and count the number of vertices. If I haven't messed up, then there's only X, Y, and Z here. So number of vertices is three. Number of edges you count is eight. Number of faces, there's one in the middle, is one. So it's four minus eight is minus three. Um, there's one boundary component. This was this idea of those free edges. Remember, this was actually this example here. So there's only one boundary component. Great. And there's a pair DD. So it's actually non-orientable. So you're good. And then we already know that we have one boundary component. We have two handles. Um, you could find them here. And it's non-orientable. So we have one. So this completely determines the surface. So it's a, a sphere with two handles, one puncture, and a mobile strip somewhere. Um, which is completely encoded in the end in the word itself, but uh, certainly in this picture here, which is kind of cool. It's kind of a cool result, right? You don't need to draw the sphere with the Mobius strip because that's hard anyway. It's a projective plane. Okay, and projective planes are a bit weird. So that's why you can kind of always get rid of them. Um, so for example, if you hash a torus to a projective plane, that's the same if you hash a uh, Climb bottle to the projective plane. Um, here is the idea of how that works. We are not going into details. You can stop the video and think about it. Uh, so here's the graphical proof that this is true. Um, you can also have a ge or the planar graphical proof that this is true. You can also think about a geometric proof that this is true. But basically, this means because the Klein bottle itself is then just made out of projective planes, as soon as you have enough of them, you can successively replace them and you only end up with zero or one of them. And it's a very simple idea. So if you have five of them, you can always go to three by getting another torus and then you go to one by getting another torus. So if you start with an odd number, you end up with one because you can always subtract uh, uh, actually one of them, for example. Um, and that's what you can do. And the point is, well, you can't jump from two to zero. You can't get you can't get this jump here done. It's the only one you can't do. And in the end, uh, you always end up with zero or one of those uh, projective planes. Anyway, um, so gluing a handle uh, to 
the projective plane is the same as gluing a client bottle to it, which is really hard to imagine. But as I said, here is the graphical proof if you want to um, think about it. And the client bottle itself is two projective planes glued together, which again, is not so easy to, to, to really visualize, but it is. So you can then replace three projective planes. That's what I had here. So P squared times three, you can actually replace it by uh, P times a torus, P times a handle. So we have reduced P from three to one. And if you play this game to the end, uh, you will see that you either need a zero or one of them. Uh, anyway, so you can always remove, uh, reduce the number of projective planes. And so projective planes are a bit hard to think of. In um, the, the words, they're actually pretty simple. So you could play the game on the words as well. Anyway, so the classification of surfaces is pretty darn amazing. So there are two ways to formulate that. Well, there are probably more, but two ways that I showed you, uh, namely you just count those numbers D, H, and P. And uh, that the other way of doing it is you just count the number of boundary components, the number of the Euler characteristic, which encodes the number of handles, and you check whether that's orientable or not. And that's completely determines the surface. And you can, that's the whole point, of this combinatorial description, you can completely do it from the polygon or from the word, whatever you prefer. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video and I also hope to see you next time.